A great explorer lost at sea, a poet who may have been murdered, and an Egyptian pharaoh lost to the Nile during a war with Julius Caesar. These people all face the same mortal enemy, water. Today, the annual Dragon Boat Festival is extremely popular. Throughout the world, people gather to race against each other in boats emblazoned with images of dragons and to celebrate Chinese culture. Though you might think the festival celebrates racing or some ancient story involving fire-breathing dragons, it actually revolves around the legend of Chu Yuan, a poet and counselor during the Warring States period of Chinese history. As the legend goes, Chu Yuan was a longtime counselor to the Chu State, but ran afoul of the emperor who sent Chu Yuan into exile. During this time, he likely wrote the poem Li Sao, about a man banished from his home by evil spirits plotting against him. From exile, Chu Yuan continued to write poetry, but he is said to have drowned himself upon hearing about the fall of Chu. The annual Dragon Boat Festival is held in Chu Yuan's honor, commemorating the search for his body in the Milo River. Following his death, a dragon is said to have stolen the offerings left for Chu Yuan's spirit, hence the inclusion of dragons in the festival. Chu Yuan lived more than 2,000 years ago, making the celebration one of the oldest in Chinese history. The drowning of Pharaoh Ptolemy XIII Theos Philopater occurred in 47 BC. At a young age, Ptolemy XIII became the Pharaoh of Egypt. However, he had to rule with his older sister slash wife, Cleopatra VII. Yes, the famous one. Is something wrong? little husband. They were driven apart by Ptolemy XIII's cohorts, and Cleopatra fled into exile. At the same time, Rome was in the midst of a civil war between Julius Caesar and General Pompey. Pompey sought refuge with Ptolemy's faction in Alexandria, but his decision proved disastrous when the Egyptians murdered Pompey in an attempt to curry favor with the powerful Caesar. But Caesar didn't agree to an alliance with Ptolemy, and instead had the fleeing pharaoh brought back to his court in Alexandria. At the same time, Cleopatra appeared before Caesar in Alexandria and became his lover. This didn't sit well with Ptolemy, and soon his Egyptian followers were at war with Caesar. In the end, Caesar was victorious. It's thought that Ptolemy drowned in the Nile River while fleeing Caesar, who would become the new pharaoh of Egypt with Cleopatra as his queen. Roman Emperor Hadrian had a wife, Vivia Sabina, but he was more interested in pursuing sexual relationships with his male companions. One of these was a young Roman man named Antinous. Hadrian was more than 30 years Antinous' senior, but the sexual mores of the day made that more common than one might think. Hadrian paid for Antinous' schooling, after which Antinous came to live with him in his villa Antivoli. They lived together as a couple for about five years, traveling around Italy, Judea, Syria, and Egypt, where the relationship came to a mysterious end. Hadrian's reputation was taking a hit. Hostile rumors arose about his debauching of adult males and his burning passion for his notorious attendant, Antinous. Antinous is thought to have drowned in the Nile in 130 AD. He may have sacrificed himself to help heal Hadrian of illness, or he may have drowned accidentally. The historical records are contradictory. Either way, Hadrian had Antinous deified and built the city of Antinoopolis on the banks of the Nile that same year, naming it in honor of his late lover and companion. Today, many see Antinous as an early gay icon, and his memory lives on. The story of Marcus Aurelius Valerius Maxentius, a disputed Roman emperor in the 3rd century, is complicated. It begins with his father, the former emperor Marcus Aurelius Valerius Maximianus. Maximianus ruled Rome for nearly 20 years before he abdicated in 305. At that point, it should have been Maxentius' turn on the throne, but he was passed over. This upset him, and he soon started to plot an insurrection, which succeeded. Maxentius was proclaimed the new emperor, but he tried to make the fact that he'd seize the throne by force a little less obvious by giving himself the title Princeps, or First Man, rather than Augustus. Of course, he soon eased into calling himself Augustus a ruler, and had one of his enemies put to death for good measure, which may have inspired Maxentius' father, the abdicated emperor Maximianus, to try to undo his abdication and take back the throne. Though Maximianus died in 310, the fight against Maxentius was continued by his ally Constantine, the two armies met at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312. That's when Maxentius fell into his own trap. But at the Milvian, he had built a temporary wooden bridge designed to collapse under the weight of Constantine's army. As Maxentius fled back towards Rome, the bridge collapsed and drowned. One day later, Constantine entered Rome with Maxentius' head on the point of a spear. Born in 1122, Frederick I, more commonly known as Frederick Barbarossa, served as the Holy Roman Emperor for 35 years, from 1155 until his death in 1190. Prior to serving as emperor, Barbarossa was king of Germany and Italy, having first ascended to the German throne in 1152. His reign was clouded by domestic disputes and challenges to his authority. He wanted to return his kingdom to the glory days of the centuries prior and started working to restore imperial prestige and authority. 
In 1154, Barbarossa and his army invaded Italy to retake it from the Normans, and he was named King of Italy and Holy Roman Emperor. He was forced to retreat, however, and wouldn't return for three years, after which he engaged in a long-running dispute with the papacy leading to his excommunication. In 1189, Barbarossa headed to Jerusalem to take part in the Third Crusade. He drowned in the Salip River, which is located in present-day Turkey. Today, Barbarossa is remembered for his attempts to reunify the Roman Empire and for his struggles with Pope Alexander III. Most people are probably familiar with the story of Pocahontas, the famous Powhatan chieftain's daughter. However, much less familiar is the story of Alexander Whitaker, the man who may have baptized her and performed her wedding ceremony. Whitaker was a clergyman born in Cambridge, England in 1585, but he came to the New World after graduating college. Whitaker, a Puritan, arrived in the Virginia colony in 1611, eventually becoming head minister for the Church of England in the colony. His nickname was the Apostle to Virginia. Some believe Whitaker performed not only the marriage between Pocahontas and John Rolfe, but also baptized her. But there was another reverend in the colony at the time, and it's not clear who performed the ceremonies, or indeed if it was the same person performing both. It is known, however, that Whitaker was a mentor to Pocahontas, which gives his claim more viability. In 1617, Whitaker drowned in the Henrico area of Virginia. He is remembered today both for his achievements for the church and for his connection to Pocahontas. By the time Percy Bysshe Shelley was admitted to University College Oxford, he had already published two novels, but his atheistic writing got him expelled from Oxford within a year. An atheist at that point, you know, the late 18th century, early 19th century, is an offense against nature. He soon got married and had two children with his wife, but the relationship was troubled from the beginning. However, Shelley soon became infatuated with Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin. Due to hostility from Mary's father, they ran off to Europe, and it was there that Mary became pregnant with their first child. Upon their return home, Percy continued to write, and so did Mary. Always one to write about topics before their time, Percy also published a book on vegetarianism. Mary's biggest claim to fame was, of course, the 1818 novel Frankenstein. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. The couple moved to Italy a few years after finally getting married, but both of their children died while they were there. Then, in 1822, Percy drowned under somewhat questionable circumstances. His body washed up on the shore. This led some to suspect he'd been murdered, though no one was ever charged, and it remains a tantalizing mystery today. One of history's most intriguing mysteries is that of Lancunio de la Seine, or the Unknown Woman of the Seine. The conundrum dates back to the late 19th century when a woman's body was pulled from the River Seine in France. Nobody knew who she was, where she was from, why she had died, or how she had ended up in the river. It was thought that she drowned, but everything else was a complete enigma. Her body was put on public display, which sounds macabre, but it was actually a normal means of identifying unknown bodies at the time. Still, no one recognized her. At one point, a death mask was made of her face. It circulated far and wide among artists, and her story even influenced books like Richard La Gallienne's The Worshipper of the Image. Nobody knew who they were drawing or writing about, but something about her face was enthralling. Here's where the story gets bizarre. Many people today are actually familiar with the unknown woman's face. They just don't realize it. Since the mid-20th century, the face of Lancagnu de la Seine has been on the CPR practice doll known as Recessa Anne. Hundreds of millions of people have locked lips with the unknown woman's face, leading some to call her the most kissed woman in the world. One of the most important explorers of all time was Bartolomeu Diaz. Diaz is most well known for being the first European to sail across the Cape of Good Hope at the tip of southern Africa. At the time, trading routes between Asia and Europe were mostly overland. This meant that trade could be shut down at any time by local governments, like the Ottoman Empire did in 1450. By opening up a sea route, Diaz created new possibilities for global trade, which would soon flourish. Diaz sailed from Portugal in August 1487, and sometime between the last week of January and the first week of February 1488, he rounded the Cape didn't make it very far up the eastern African coastline before his crew urged him to turn back. But by then, Diaz had already ensured his place in the history books, and the world would never be the same. Following his return to Portugal in late 1488, Diaz continued to explore. He served as a consultant to another famed explorer, Vasco da Gama. In 1500, Diaz returned to the Cape of Good Hope, but drowned in a shipwreck and was lost at sea. It was a fitting, if tragic, end for one of history's greatest explorers. Piero di Lorenzo de' Medici, or Piero the Unfortunate, was born in 1472 and became ruler of Florence following his father, Lorenzo de' Medici's death in 1492. Sadly for Piero, he was nowhere near the statesman his father had been and his rule fell far short of magnificent. In just two years, Piero was ousted and exiled after making a poorly conceived agreement with Charles VIII, the King of France, who was invading Italy. But it wasn't the French who chased Piero from the city. 
the disavowed Florentine population did that. Piero never stopped trying to return to power. However, his plots all failed, and he died less than a decade after being banished. He drowned in the Garigliano River in 1503, leaving behind an unfortunate legacy.